Um, my role as a mother changed forever when my 19 year old son was diagnosed with schizophrenia. My career changed too as a result. Um, I started presenting with the Schizophrenia Society, the um, uh, working on a provincial project for Alberta caregivers, and this was followed by uh, facilitating a support group for parents and uh, caregivers with CMHA Edmonton. Uh, presently, I still do guest speaking at colleges, um, corporations and events across Alberta, and today my son is in his early 30s, so you can see my story could have been a very long one. Um, I'm still passionate about informing, educating, and challenging beliefs in the uh, um, mental health field. So um, for me, this breaking the silence is very important. Um, I guess you could say that uh, I'm now in the business of uh, conquering apathy. That's what I'm good at doing, I think. So thank you, and I'll now handle it to, over to Melanie. Hi, um, I'm Melanie Robles, and um, I'm a family physician with some credentials in emergency medicine, and I'm also a mother, mother of three children who are now young adults. So together with my husband uh, of 28 years, we are parents. When our middle child uh, was just shy of her 18th birthday, she suffered the devastating and permanent uh, effects of a psychotic illness. And our story as a family became, the, uh, became part of a large collection of other families' stories, um, all of us walking this arduous journey. So I hope that it is useful to you who are listening, that I'm coming at this presentation from, with, from the perspective of having one uh, foot in clinical practice and the other in lived experience. Thanks, Melanie. <clears throat> so the overview of our presentation um, is structured with four sections. Uh, we're going to do the history of Family Alberta. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, we're going to uh, look at some illustrating examples of how uh, education and understanding can improve support. And uh, we'll also have some time to leave uh, opportunities for questions and or discussion. So about us, um, FAMI Alberta. So FAMI is actually an acronym and FAMI stands for Families Supporting Adults with Mental Illness in Alberta. <laughs> so we're a community of family members who banded together in 2016 uh, to support one another and advocate for improved services and treatment for those living with serious mental illness. Now, serious mental illness, you may see on, see on some of the slides, it's abbreviated to SMI. Um, I'd like to explain also that uh, family, Alberta defines family members as parents, spouses, siblings, aunties, uncles, grandmas, and uh, friends, whoever the loved one sees as being that they're closest to. Now, back in November 2016, we held our first Love You Forever workshop. Uh, that was attended by over 100 family members and other caregivers related to that event. Um, and it was in fact a catalyst uh, for forming the FAMI um, Alberta group. With the support of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Edmonton Region, and the Alberta Health Services, also known as AHS, uh, a core group met over the next few months to organize what we thought would make excellent follow-up activities, and that included biannual workshops, and other ways to advocate for loved ones with uh, SMI. Our website is one of the outcomes of that group. So we presently have the support, administrative support with CMHA Edmonton office, which we're very grateful for. And um, it's interesting to note that the November 2016, the first Love You Forever event, that those 100 families and caregivers of adults living with SMI came together with a common story. Now that common story actually uh, described four very common things. Everyone had expectedly found themselves in a frightening or disorienting world of serious mental illness. 
they were caught between an intense desire to support their loved one and being seen as problematic <laughs> rather than a team member. And there was also the issue of stigma. Um, carrying the burden emotionally, socially and financially with inadequate support and knowing that their loved one holistically, they knew them so well because of course we're their parents and uh, we know them from beginning uh, to the, the point of them becoming ill. But interestingly enough, we also shared another common story about our experiences. As we had gone in search of help and support and for inclusion, it was a system that didn't validate our capacity to be supportive to our loved ones, nor did it seem to be aware of how to direct us to resources to help us. So every family in this journey basically had to reinvent the wheel. Suddenly, uh, we have become a caregiver, no longer just their family member, and this situation impacts both of us, both the young adult living with a serious mental illness and their family caregiver in ways that we never could have imagined. Now, in my case, um, my son was diagnosed when he was the age of 19, and uh, so he was considered an adult in the eyes of the law. So I was not informed of his diagnosis. Um, when he was sent home, um, I called the pharmacy to find out what his prescription medications were for. And um, he told me it was for psych uh, schizophrenia. And uh, I asked how to spell that because I'd never heard that word before. And with that spelling, I proceeded to go to the Google and uh, it was Google that first educated me. And uh, the things that I noticed is there was no compassion, no hope and no cure. And that's a pretty bad thing for a, a mother to learn and that was the foundation that I was going to be working from. So it is our common story and our common experiences that help to shape our mission and vision. And they are these. So first of all, I'd like to clarify that uh, serious mental illnesses include schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, and borderline personality disorder. So our mission is through collaboration with other organizations, FAMI Alberta promotes and provides advocacy, education and information to help families be effective lifelong supporters of adult loved ones living with the effects of serious mental illness. Our vision, all families have efficient access to the necessary resources to be effective lifetime supporters and caregivers of adult loved ones living with the effects of a serious mental illness. So why should we also advocate for the family members? Well, individuals with serious mental illnesses or SMI are recognized as having a lifetime diagnosis with no cure. Now in borderline personality disorder, it's distinct from schizophrenia and there can be improvement in the disease over time uh, given good therapy and support. So we'd like to clarify that a little bit. But also family members and other supporters need support and education in order to partner with and help the person with SMI attain a new normal and be able to manage their illness. We want them to be able to have support and be effective for a lifetime, either the family member's lifespan with the continuity, continuity plan or their loved one's lifespan. So I'm going to pass that over to Melanie now, and she'll give you also an introduction of herself. Thank you, Melanie. So um, as parents of our adult children with serious mental illness, we know certainly that our families would do better if we received adequate support and education. And so in this slide, we see the continuity between or the progression between um, no, increased knowledge and caregiver support, decreased fear and burnout, and ultimately leading to better capacity to effectively and sustainably support our loved ones. So this concept is actually also uh, well supported by research that suggests that certain evidence-based interventions for families, which can be delivered over six to nine months or at least four sessions, 
ultimately um, reduces burden and distress amongst families and improves um, family uh, relations. Um, so we can say unequivocally that advocating for the family is good for the family. Next slide, Laurie. But um, do we know with certitude that advocating for the family is good for the individual with serious mental illness? Well, as it turns out, the Mental Health Commission of Canada published an extensive document in 2013, um, which after a thorough review of research uh, concludes that there is ample evidence that supporting family caregivers benefits all stakeholders, including people who are living with mental illness, family caregivers themselves, and both the mental health system and society as a whole. So we can say with confidence that um, medication um, is essential, but not as standalone therapy. And also that family support combined with medical treatment is the primary predictor for a meaningful recovery and management of serious mental illness. So what Family Alberta does is uh, provide advocacy and education. Um, what's unique about Family Alberta is we are family members with lived experience. Uh, this is important to know when you consider the original meaning of the word advocacy. It's a, a Latin word that comes back to advocare and li literally means to call out for support or for pleading someone's cause. But advocacy is more than influencing public policy. It's also about influencing public opinion. And that leads me to the education piece. With our lived experience, we offer um, educational support in our relationships uh, with other caregivers. And we also demonstrate hope that they too uh, can survive this, this journey, not only survive, but thrive in it. Um, through our public speaking, to anyone who will have us, uh, we share our stories and those stories educate and create understanding which in turn influences opinions and attitudes. We too want to help stamp out stigma. Families and their loved ones don't need sympathy uh, or the stigma. We both need support and understanding. So this is what we do. Uh, we enhance public awareness of the rights, strengths, needs, and interests of families who support adults with serious mental illness. And there's that SMI we talked about. Influence law and policy to improve public and private systems of support and services to families and their adult children with SMI. And advocate that such changes to policies are viewed through the caregiver policy lens, and this is a recommendation found in Mental Health Canada Commission in 2013, that far ago. <laughs> Share our knowledge and conduct training and events to help connect families and communities to inform efforts to broaden understanding and fight stigma across the province. So <clears throat> a recent example uh, is when family members were contacted and asked to respond to calls for engagement in the survey last winter about the Mental Health Act. Uh, we provided the family's perspectives and um, now I would like to share with you some of our achievements. <clears throat> so remember that we came together in 2006, or sorry, 2016. Um, so that's less than four years ago. Um, so we, as you can see, we've been very hard at work. So don't let this one slide uh, fool you. So right now our current advocacy involves Bill 17, the Mental Health Amendment Act from 2020. Uh, now you might recall, I mentioned that family members responded for engagement last winter about that. Um, I encourage you to check out our website. Uh, there's some wonderful new valuable information there and some updates on the topic that uh, maybe you'd like to know about. And what you'll know is we're not done yet. 
Um, we have some wonderful experiences with the uh, Alberta government, Alberta Health and AHS, um, but I really only like to focus on a couple of the ones we're most proud of, I guess you could say. Um, so one of them would be Alberta Health Services uh, has recognized and consulted, uh, you know, FAMI Alberta on many different initiatives, but uh, one of the latest ones was the development of the new Access 24-7 Hospital. Um, pretty happy about that. Um, also, um, we've successfully advocated to Alberta Health for change to provincial drug policy uh, regarding the coverage of injectable antipsychotics. So, yeah, we're pretty happy with all, all types of things. And the, the list is rather long. I, I won't go through it all. Um, so under education, our Love You Forever events uh, certainly have become more and more popular. We're seeing more and more uh, attendance there. Um, it's an opportunity, it's not just for families, but for local healthcare providers. And there are great educational speakers, guest speakers that attend this event. Uh, LEAP is wonderful. Melanie will talk a little bit about that as we go along. But I'd like to draw your attention to the Alberta Summit on Mental Illness, which uh, is planned to be held on May of 2021. So that's coming up. So here, FAMI is leading a partnership, which includes the Alberta Alliance of Mental Illness and Mental Health, Alberta Health Services, CMHA, and University of Alberta. And here's what's really cool. The purpose of the conference is to bring the mental health researchers, practitioners, and supporters together to learn and share the best possible science and practices relating to detection, treatment, and support for people with serious mental illnesses. So if you want to register and learn a little bit more about that, check us out on our website. Um, I guess I could also say that now Melanie gets to talk. <laughs> Come on over, Melanie. <laughs> okay, that brings us to section three of our talk, which um, is which describes how education can improve the capacity to support loved ones with serious mental illness. So, um, in this diagram the the three triangles within a triangle we'd like to illustrate how education about the nature of serious mental illness interfaces with evidence-based tools that can be effectively used to support loved ones with serious mental illness and help to create family resilience it is in the process of learning from both theory and from trial and error uh, that those who have lived experience become credible advocates. They themselves become the caregiver lens through which policy can be evaluated, um, changed and improved. So we'll, we'll focus on the first triangle, which is on the bottom left hand side, um, which is education about serious mental illness. So education is first and foremost for ourselves as family members, and secondly, for wider communities, including healthcare systems, legal and judicial systems, vocational and academic systems, in other words, for all stakeholders in the domain of serious mental illness. And I'd like to illustrate the direct relevance of this. Next slide. So take for example, the subject of disability in psychotic illness. So when it comes to disability pertaining to psychotic illness, there are easy to recognize deficits and then there's not so easy to identify deficits. What we call positive symptoms, which are basically delusions and hallucinations, they're easy to recognize by most lay people and they are comparatively tangible. On the other hand, cognitive and negative symptoms, for example, impaired judgment, planning, concentration, 
ability to self-analyze, social skills, motivation, and energy can often be mistaken for laziness, bad character, immorality, stupidity, teenage rebellion, or failure to require oneself to pay attention. Such unfortunate interpretation of brain function deficits can lead to stigma. Stigma is defined as a mark of disgrace assigned to the individual with serious mental illness or to their family or possibly to both. Stigma can develop in the eyes of doctors, nurses, law enforcement officers, educators, and other community or family members. Clearly, education needs to extend beyond the family who themselves bear the responsibility for leading the way. They see and, rec and experience what the medical team cannot fully appreciate. They have lived through the trauma of their loved one's illness and sadly, all too frequently, the invalidation of their roles, or worse, through repetitive overt or covert assignment of blame. Conversely, the medical team can play an important role in educating the family regarding resources and preparedness without breaching the privacy of their client. So we at FAMI spend a lot of time talking amongst ourselves and educating people um, about the symptom of anosognosia. So anosognosia is defined as an individual's inability to understand or recognize his or her symptoms of illness. It's not to be confused with denial. It's better understood as an extreme form of brain deficit in self-analysis. For instance, as in the case in some strokes where a patient um, it, it will, lack, will lack the acknowledgement of one side of the body, to that patient, the right side of the body simply does not exist. This is a better analogy for what anosognosia is. Anosognosia is uh, the terrible catch-22 of psychotic illness. Catch-22 means that there's no way to solve a problem because of the nature of the problem itself. It is vexingly often the reason why people with psychotic symptoms cannot access optimal medical therapy because of their psychotic symptoms. When someone sees no need for treatment because they perceive no problem, family can serve to improve the likelihood of adherence to medication and treatment programs. But does this work? If so, how? Um, and that brings us to the bottom right-hand triangle, uh, which is tools for supportive relationship. So it's linked to education, and it can be thought of as a new set of skills. We may think that we have good communication skills with our colleagues, our spouse, our other children, but there are new things to learn and practice in the context of supportive communication with our loved ones with SMI. So acquiring new skills firstly requires a degree of readiness. Many family members ha uh, may find themselves in prolonged states of shock and moving along that grief curve at their own rates. They may first and foremost require emotional support before coming to readiness. FAMI is not a support group 
in its function. We are an advocacy and education group. But many of our members have direct connections to excellent caregiver support groups, and we include those links on our website. At FAMI, we do have trained leaders in a method called LEAP, which stands for listen, empathize, agree, and partner. And it's an internationally accepted tool, uh, communication tool, which was developed by US psychologist, Dr. Xavier Amador. And it's particularly useful in communication strategies with loved ones who have anosognosia. Family members hopefully can learn to come more alongside their loved ones and perhaps be recognized by their loved ones as being supportive. And we've included a link to um, the website for more information about the LEAP program. The third bullet in this slide says radical acceptance. And that is a term that was coined by another psychologist, Dr. Marcia Linehan, in her development of a program, Dialectical Behavior Therapy. And it means the concept of letting go of what one wants and what one doesn't have with complete acceptance of reality in the moment. And radical acceptance is part of an evidence-based therapy to treat emotional dysregulation, which is classically present in borderline personality disorder, but can also occur in primary psychotic illness because of cognitive impairment. It's also a useful tool for family members who struggle with certain phases of their loved one's disease. Um, and um, if they may be in disbelief and having trouble moving forward. The last bullet on this slide um, shows a balance between support and privacy and autonomy. And this idea has many nuances in the context of serious mental illness. And Laurie's going to explore this a little bit on the next slide. Thank you. Oops, went too far. <laughs> I have a tickle in my throat and it could be because I have an allergy to cats, so forgive me if I cough. <laughs> well, in trying to obtain a balance uh, between privacy, autonomy, and support, we can ask in this case, who's the cat and who is the mouse? So first I'd like to explore the idea that the adult child with SMI feels like they are the mouse and that the cat is the medical profession. And it's much later in their journey uh, into wellness that the adult child comes to terms with their illness and the cat will now represent that diagnosis and the stigma that it carries. Parents too can feel like that mouse because of this set of frightening and disorienting circumstances also known as the journey and the cat represents the fear of a bad outcome or a bad ending. Um, parents carry that very, very heavily, a sense of responsibility about that. Now let's look again, and parents can now be represented by that cat. They see themselves as being helpful and well-meaning, harmless, soft, warm, cuddly. However, the adult child, again portrayed by the mouse, sees the cat as a threat and a bully. So as you can see, without that balance between privacy, autonomy, and support, the parents and or the medical profession will be seen as the cat by our loved ones, um, which behave like a mouse, and often they run away to find a place to hide from the cat. <clears throat> I'd like to share with you also um, a little bit of a a demonstrative slide regarding anosognosia. Now this illustration, if you look at the person in the middle, uh, they have that sad and confused and shocked emoji face. And uh, so we're attempting to show the perception of relationships from the point of view of the individual with 
the serious mental illness and those people that surround them, which include family, their friends, uh, doctors, police, and many more um, in this illustration are attempting to be helpful, but that's based on their perception of what they see, not what they know. And now let's look at it from the family caregiver's perspective. So the fellow in the middle with that emoji face, uh, they're being provided with what I call well-meaning helpful advice, um, but it actually feels and sounds a lot more like judgment. And that can come from a spouse, co-workers, friends, extended family, and more. And again, this is usually based on lack of understanding or the stigma of that serious mental illness. So as a personal story about that, I remember my friends would call me and they would tell me uh, to kick my son out. Uh, he's lazy, he needs to grow up, you're too easy on him. Um, they really didn't understand what my son was going through and uh, I wasn't able to educate them on what was really going on. I didn't really know at that point myself, but I was very grateful for call displays so I could take or not take calls. So again, the importance of proper education and support for family members, or, which are also the caregivers, we could then become equipped to educate about anosognosia, about the serious mental illness, and this helps everyone become true supporters uh, of our loved one, and us. So I'd like to say that we need to become partners in our journey with our loved one. And as my son now says, my mom and I were a team. <clears throat> so Melanie. So um, in conclusion, um, those are a few examples of how credible advocacy rests on uh, the base of education, skills and lived experience. And we would um, like to end with two quotations which speak to each of us and Lori is going to share hers. First, I'd like to uh, share the meaning of apathy. It's often confused with um, empathy and that's different. Apathy is a lack of interest, enthusiasm or concern. So in this quotation from Rollo May from his book, The Courage to Create, where he says, apathy adds up in the long run to cowardice. And I guess you could say that that speaks to me because I'm in the business of, I guess you guessed it, conquering apathy. Melanie? And my quotation comes from Pavel Casals, who is a famous musician and humanitarian. The capacity to care is the thing which gives life its deepest significance and those words being chosen very carefully that the um, capacity indicating signifying ability uh, to do the act of caring in the context of serious mental illness capacity to care is linked to skills to care and is heavily predicated on systems that value the importance of family in helping to shape society toward radical inclusivity. Thanks, Melanie. That takes us to our last slide where we are opening our time up to you for questions and uh, we'll wait and hear from you. <laughs> Hi, so we already have one question and that is, does FAMI help people with severe depression as well? Mm, that's, that's a really good question. I don't think we would turn that person away if they're a caregiver uh, to someone, you know, that's suffering with that. Um, and they could certainly check our uh, website for any resources that maybe they didn't know about that exist. Uh, but yeah, they could certainly get in touch with us. Okay. And do you want to talk a little bit about um, when FAMI meets and what being part of the group looks like? Okay, well, uh, FAMI typically meets once a month um, and we're 
actually not going to be meeting over the summer. It's too short for everybody. So we'll resume our activities in September. Uh, and you'll know about that if you get onto our website and sign up for the newsletter, which is free. It comes to you by uh, email. And that keeps you posted as to when the meetings will be held, where they will be held, and the time, and if there's going to be a guest speaker and things like that. So definitely get onto our website and sign up for that newsletter. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? You can just add it into the chat box and I can read it for you. Um, I can personally attest to the value of their newsletter. They write articles on their website and you'll get to read them through the newsletter sometime and they're all wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, it, look, it looks like we don't have any more. Great. Well, if any more come in, I guess you could always forward them along to us at our uh, email and uh, we can address them then. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lori and Melanie. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for inviting us. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much. Take care. Bye now.